Spotlight, come talk about their GDU accelerated database built on Postgres. Uh, he, did, he sort of has a cagey background and didn't really give me the full details of what his bio is, so I don't really know what else to say other than he was a rugby player, he has five kids, he lives in London, but he's not British, he's South African, so don't be confused by his posh accent. It's not, it's not British, okay? Go for cool. it. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Right, hi everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is Bright Lights, obviously, uh, and our GP accelerated database. Uh, and we're using it for accelerating analytic workloads to deliver speed of thought analytics. A little bit about me. Thanks, Andy, for the intro. Um, so I'm the founder and CEO of Bright Lights. Um, started the company around about four years ago. Originally, my background is in engineering. Um, that's a picture of UCT. So that's where I'm in a university in Cape Town, lovely university. Um, and I had a bursary from a mining uh, company. And so straight after university, I went and worked on the mines, which is this picture over here. Like literally in the mines? Literally, I was an engineer on the mines, going underground. <clears throat> and every day, I had to go past this sign, which said, uh, congratulations on getting through 8 million shifts without killing anybody. So I thought that was maybe not the best place to uh, spend my working career. And two years after that, or spending two years on that, I then got into uh, business intelligence, databases, and analytics, and that's pretty much the story since then. I always think it's interesting with these kinds of talks to understand what was the genesis, what was the starting point. Um, and in 2008, um, I was sort of between roles. I'm a very inquisitive person, uh, and engineering was a great course for me. And I came across an article which is basically some hackers that worked out how to use GPUs to crack passwords, brute, brute uh, force um, cracking. And I just thought that was really, really interesting. GPUs were just starting to emerge where they would be uh, used for these sort of um, non-graphic for generic type workloads for data processing. Um, and it was fascinating that you could use a GPU for something else. So uh, at the time, my first son had been born um, and uh, we didn't have a lot of uh, financial resources available to us. So I had to go to eBay to get uh, a GeForce 8800. Got it, worked out how to use it. Um, fascinating, uh, but uh, cracking passwords and so on wasn't really a use case that I was interested in. So it, um, the GPU sort of gathered dust for a couple of years. And then I joined a company called um, Dunhumby, and they were doing a lot of things with data analytics. They were responsible for the loyalty program of Tesco's, which is the biggest retailer in the UK, and it's got a global footprint. They were making a lot of money from understanding what customers were doing uh, by all the data they were collecting. Um, but the tools behind that were really struggling to keep up with the kind of data loads. And that was the epiphany. That was where I thought, you know what? GPUs could be a solution to really accelerate the kind of queries that uh, companies like Dynamby were using to understand what their customers were doing. And that was the start of the journey. Um, started researching how one could uh, run predominantly SQL operations on GPU. Um, sorting is pretty well understood, as, in, as is all the sort of aggregations, as is filtering. But what was really tricky at the time was working out how to do joins in parallel, because obviously GPUs are coming to it, parallel devices. Um, and so any algorithm that you want to use needs to be parallelizable. Embarrassing parallelizable is, uh, is the term that people like to use. Um, and I spent about 18 months researching this space, trying to work out how to do joins efficiently on GPU. Found an algorithm. Uh, it's called recursive interaction probability. Uh, allows us to do these joins on GPU very efficiently. And I still remember the evening sitting with my wife, uh, talking about what I discovered and the use cases and the opportunities. At the time, kid count had gone up to four. Um, so there were some real, you know, challenges that we needed to uh, think about. You can't just embark on these kinds of journeys um, when you've got a lot of other people dependent. Um, today, kid count is at five, like Andy was uh, telling you. Journey's been fantastic. And um, what we have today is a, a GPU accelerated database that's allowing us to um, really accelerate SQL, uh, SQL um, operations. So um, just to run through some of those, uh, you know, differentiators, um, being based on Postgres, um, being um, able to access our patent pending IP, uh, and also tapping into our fourth generation GPU manager, which allows us to uh, bring 
SQL workloads uh, and AI workloads together. And that's fundamental to uh, how we've implemented our technology and some of the technology decisions that we've, uh, we've chosen. Um, as I'm talking, obviously, you know, if there's any questions that you'd like to ask, please jump in and I'll stop and I'll answer those questions. So please feel free to do that. What it's all about then, you know, some of this is the, the marketing uh, aspect of stuff, but uh, it's really delivering time to value for analysts. Um, very interesting survey, recent survey. 32% uh, of analysts are still having to deal with uh, slow query speeds. 64% um, of analysts 64% of analysts' time is still spent using uh, SQL-type tools to prepare data uh, and so on. Only three days a month is spent uh, actually doing some of the clever stuff with uh, machine learning and AI. Um, and amazingly, 37% of insight takes more than a week to generate. So you might come in with an idea on Monday morning and you spend the entire week trying to find the answer to that. Uh, you go home on a Friday afternoon, you still haven't really resolved found a, an answer to that question. And a big uh, element of that is actually being able to get the answers quickly from the, the data, to be able to query those, uh, formulate those questions, hit the database, and get those answers out. Time to value, Google is a great example of what time to value means. I often speak to people and they're like, well, you know what, I can run a query in five minutes, that's fine. But actually, really, is it? Because with Google, there's two things that really generate value out of Google. One is that the answers are correct. The second is uh, time to value is really important. You get those answers immediately. So you can ask your question, get your answer, and start thinking about the next question immediately. If Google took just 30 seconds to answer a question, that would be really uh, you know, unacceptable, and you just wouldn't be using Google. It wouldn't be able to deliver that value to you. So that's why I think uh, time to value is really important. And what we want to be doing is giving analysts that Google experience where they can just hit the database, get the answers to their questions immediately, and really think about the problem at hand rather than struggling with uh, you know, sitting around, eating pizza, waiting for your queries to come back, right? So that's where GPUs come in, and it's the fantastic uh, capabilities of GPUs. So there's two capabilities in there, characteristics. One is obviously the compute, um, massively better than CPU type architectures, and that gap is actually growing. So next year and the year on, GPUs are going to continue extending this advantage. And the other thing really important to databases is being able to feed that compute. So memory I.O., getting data onto those GPUs um, is very, very fast. GPU today can transfer data or process data at around about a terabyte a second. And if you look at CPU RAM, it's about 100 gig a second. You can get eight GPUs into a machine. In fact, NVIDIA's latest uh, machine, GDX2, you can put 16 GPUs in there. Uh, so you can actually process data at 16 terabytes a second, which is you know, awesome. The big thing about databases is the actual compute is not really a big factor. People might tell you that, but actually, invariably, what you're doing is just comparing two, um, two values to get a, to get to, to, for the basis of sorting or for joining. Um, so actually, the real, the real benefit from GPUs is very much their ability to deliver data very quickly out of memory. Last of the marketing slides. So how fast is ultra fast? We've done benchmarks on a billion row data set. The fastest of those queries have come back in five milliseconds. The slower of those queries has come back in 150 milliseconds. If you think about Usain Bolt, you know, 150 milliseconds, five milliseconds, what does that mean for us in real time? Usain Bolt in the starters blocks, the gun goes off. It takes him about 155 milliseconds just to start moving, just to start twitching a muscle. If he moved quicker than that, he would be disqualified because human perception is in the realm of 120 milliseconds. So bright light on billion rows data sets, absolutely delivering, as far as we're concerned, real-time analytics. How many GPUs is that query? So that was on uh, five Minsky machines, five Power 8 machines, four GPUs each. The interesting thing about GPUs, which is, I think, uh, a good point that you, you know, touching on there, is um, basically the data, you will scale your hardware with data. If you need more data, you very really have to bring on more GPU power. So the response times are actually linear. So we will get 550 millisecond response times regardless of if it's a, a billion-row data set or even bigger. You'd be scaling the data out.
there'd be scaling of hardware out as the as the data set uh, increased. I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're going to get to the architecture, but like certainly coalescing with all the machines, taking the result and coalescing from the different GPUs and putting it together, like that one. The overheads, it's, yeah, the overheads of uh, managing everything are actually pretty small. Um, particularly in um, analytic databases. So for transactional databases, the overheads of uh, you know managing the transaction and getting the data to where it needs to be, those are quite high, and obviously you, that would be a factor. But when you're looking at a analytic database, the management is actually the, the overhead of managing all the hardware and bringing everything together is actually quite small, uh, and definitely less than five milliseconds. So we can do everything, bring it all together, and deliver the result in five milliseconds. Um, one of the things that allows us to do this is um, our patent pending IP, recursive interaction probability. Um, and this really touches on the GPUs, right? So the ability to um, get this great performance is dependent on being able to do stuff in parallel. That's what makes a GPU great. But it, on the other side of that coin, there's a real technical challenge there because you have to do everything in parallel to actually realize the benefits. And so what recursive interaction probability allows us to do, particularly for joins, is um, tap into that parallel nature of the GPU fully, and uh, fully realize the potential of the GPUs while still being able to do the SQL type operations, particularly joins. Um, so just a little bit of uh, talk about uh, recursive, prob uh, recursive interaction probability, parallelizable, uh, embarrassingly so. Very efficient when you look at big O notation, uh, four joins. Um, when you compare n log n to something as simple as binary search, which is log n, um, this kind of algorithm is very, very efficient. Um, and just a simple description of what it is, what uh, recursive interaction probability is. If you think about a join, so just uh, to understand the audience, just if everybody could stick up their hands who knows what a join is, Okay, everybody, right. Okay, excellent. Okay. So uh, what you're doing in a join, you've got your two relations and you've got your two columns and you're basically <coughs> wanting to find matches in those two columns. Okay. If you think about those two columns, let's say they uh, are just numbered 1 to 12. Okay, you've got two columns, 1 to 12 each, and you want to join them. One way is a, a nested for loop. And so you're comparing uh, every element in the one column to every element in the other. Okay. So 144 operations, comparisons. But imagine if... Because it's sorted, you chop each of those columns into four subpartitions, and you look at the uh, the boundaries on each of those partitions, and you compare those boundaries. The top subpartition that goes from one to four, um, the uh, boundary elements are one and four, and the ending partition goes from eight to twelve, nine to twelve, nine to twelve. There's no way that they're going to get a join interaction there, right? So you can discard those, and so. By doing those subpartitions, you're going to know that the first two subpartitions have got a likelihood, a, uh, a likelihood, and not a non-zero likelihood of interacting. And your first two partitions will satisfy the criteria. The second two partitions will do third two and the fourth two. So straight away, you're now looking at uh, if you then did the base case of four by four, you've got 16 comparisons per partition, and you've got four partitions that you're going to be uh, evaluating, so you've got 64 comparisons. Now, 144 to 64 is not great, but if you think about a billion row data set, and if you think about doing this operation recursively, you start to discard huge amounts of uh, comparisons that you'd never be needing to do anyway. Does that make sense? Do I need to do it on the board? That's the Grace hash joint from the 1980s. Is it? Yeah, just to putting things in the buckets, and so you link up things in the buckets when you like, have that same hash key. Right, but you're not hashing, you're, you're, you're pre-sorting. Actually, yeah, how are you making sure things match up? So what we're doing is you do it recursively and you're looking for a non-zero probability that you'll get an interaction. And you'll know there's an interaction by looking at the boundary elements. All right, so yeah, I think you're missing that. Everything's pre-sorted. Yep. Right? And then you're basically doing divide and conquer. And you're breaking things up in chunks. Correct. And then you know the upper bound and the lower bound. Correct. And then... On on say say the say on, on the on the outer table, right? So you're doing you're doing recursively splitting them up into chunks. And then yep. you have upper bound, lower bound. Yep. And then now you do the same splitting on the other side? Uh you would you'd start, you'd split both sides into four, say. Yeah. And compare those and look at which ones of those will interact. 
Ah, ah, and then, okay, okay. then you apply the same algorithm to the ones that have just formed uh, an interaction, split those into four, find the ones of those that'll be interacting, split those into four, find those interacting, and you go all the way yeah. down from a billion row data set down to a base case of say four, or yeah. whatever, right? Absolutely. Yes, it does have to be pre-sorted. Yeah. So there's a cost of uh, sorting. But with indexing, you can get around that. So if you index those two columns, uh, you, could, uh, you could get around that. GPs are very good at sorting as well. And the alternatives are, um, you know, hash join. And there are some limitations with hash join. You need to have a big enough uh, join spa uh, hash space for one of the relations. So we, I was talking to Annie about this, um, and basically we just we just sort it, uh, sorting a, a permutation of the the data. So we we're using pointers to yeah, it's a sorted uh, projection. Yeah. Yes, sir. So on your big notation, what is your n with regards to, and what is your uh, bound? Like, what are you what are you bounding? Like. Uh, number of elements in the in that are going to be compared. So if you have two lists and they are n elements and m elements, uh, basically n and n became the same thing. Um, I mean, it, it, the the performance improvement from uh, nested for loop. Now I know that that's you know the worst case scenario, but we did a benchmark a couple of years ago on um, I think it was like uh, one and a half billion uh, elements. Um, so 750 million each. We were able to do that on a single GPU in like three minutes. Uh, and if you had the runtime on nested for loop, it would have been 30 years. So, you know, I was talking about 144 to 64, but when you look at those really big, um, because it, it scales uh, logarithmically or, or exponentially, um, for very big joins, it's very, very efficient. And parallelizable and very easy to code up. Um, you know, there are other algorithms out there that one can use that are parallelizable. Uh, index nested for loop is another one. Um, but this this is a very good GPU enabled join algorithm. So that you have parallel complexity. So so is O and log n predicated on the fact you have how many cores? That's total number of um, I don't know if I can answer that question, but um it's basically the it's non parallel. Non-parallel, yeah, okay. Okay, so, yeah, so if it's parallel, then you'd, you'd be, be, but if you put it, if it was parallel, you'd be dividing it by a, a number, which which kind of comes out anyway. You, you don't, you don't uh, consider constants in big O. Um, yeah, so I think what you're describing is basically grace hash drawing with variable size buckets, and then you're not hashing, everything's already pre-sorted, so that, so you, you're getting that benefit. It's almost like a, it's not a sort merge, but like, it's like you're not paying the cost of actually having to build up a hash table. Yeah. Everything's already pre-sorted. Yeah. And then you, you then you're you look at large buckets and then the goal would be, all right, if I since I'm pre-sorted, I know my upper bound lower bound and upper bound. If nothing matches, then I just gave away I just I just, you just discarded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm also curious, do you have uh, this projected uh, pre-sorted column for every column, every table? Um, so uh, you would choose, your indexing, you can choose by indexing to say which ones you want to pre-sort, and that's, that's why we call it indexing. Okay, okay. Um, if there was no indexes, then you would just sort it. Okay. You'd, there was, there'd be the overhead of sorting. Yeah. So his, his big O is missing the sort time. Yeah, that's if right. If not sorted, you got to sort it. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I think, I think most of the algorithms the, the, the good algorithms are n log n. So it would be n log n plus n log n. Something like that. Would that be right? So it'd yeah. still be n log n. Everything's in memory, so yeah. Yeah. Okay, so brilliant. We're you know, very proud of that. Um, what I also want to now talk a little bit about is what the other vendors are doing and the challenges that they are overcoming. So, you know, our our approach is very GPU focused. We're using pointers. Everything is in GPU RAM. And that means that we can really tap into the GPU power. And one of the things that we can tap into is the fantastic performance that you can get from data bandwidth, right? So we can process data at eight terabytes a second. In fact, with the, the GDX2, it could be 16 terabytes a second. Um, and databases, 
when it comes down to it, that's one of the key challenges that you're trying to solve is data I.O. The operations are actually really trivial. Um, it's really getting the data to the, to the, to the cores to do the processing that really counts, right? Um, so Brightlight is a GPU-focused database, so we can really tap into that. Kinetica, their approach is very much centered on using the CPU RAM as the, the basic storage um, and then offloading to GPU where necessary. Um, and what that means is, sure, they can look at bigger data sets, but it also means they're bound by the hardware constraints in CPU RAM. So one of those constraints is that you can only read data at 100 uh, gig a second. And this is all, you know, basically per machine, right? Um, Scream, another GPU accelerated database. What they're doing, and you can see it from the performance uh, results as well. So I've got, I've got a slide on that. Um, but they're focusing on getting data off disk to GPU. And there, the bottleneck is going to be on disk, right? So when you look at the performance characteristics of these different approaches, they actually match up with sort of existing solutions. Scream being uh, disk based or disk focused means that the kind of database performance that they're going to see is going to be very much related to the traditional disk based solutions. Kinetica is going to be very similar to the kind of in-memory solutions that you, you see today. Bright Light, obviously, is going to be quite different um, to that, and, and we are very focused, and that, I think, is one of the things that really differentiates us from the uh, other vendors. Uh, yeah? So wouldn't the 8,000 gigabytes a second only be between NVM, uh, the NVLink and the HVM2? What happens? Okay, so that question is all about where the data is actually located to start off with. And when we, when we create a table, we create, we allocate GPU RAM and the data comes onto the GPUs at the point of ingest. So it's already on the GPU by the time the query gets executed. So there's no data transfer. Only uh, the results have to get off. Uh, correct. Forward. Exactly right. You just have to get the data, do the process and get the results off. I've got a bit more on, there's a limit there because it means that you have to have enough GPU hardware to, to be able to, to deal with the data set. Exactly right. So that's a good point there. Um, and I've got a slide on that of how we're going to uh, extend that out and start to use a lot more CPU RAM for these kinds of workloads. Just, uh, you know, one of the challenges, uh, there's, there's a bunch of challenges when you start building a GPU database. Obviously, the parallel nature of GPUs is one and writing CUDA kernels and all that kind of thing. But uh, at a higher level, one's also got to look at all the different moving parts from a parallel uh, perspective and we we sort of list these in four levels of parallelization. So the GPUs themselves, obviously parallel devices, that needs to be taken care of and managed in a specific way with the specific algorithms that are appropriate. Uh, level three, there's a way of uh, streaming data onto GPUs while they are processing and streaming data off GPUs. So there's a parallel element there. And level three is actually where we would. Uh, start making use of uh, using CPU resources, so uh, the streaming of off, off CPU RAM onto GPU. Level two is now you've got a bunch of devices all on a single machine. They need to be coordinated and uh, they need to be executed in parallel. And very similar to level two is level one, which is, right, I've got a bunch of machines. How do I manage those? And actually level one is um, uh, dealt with by a, a GPU manager hub, and that controls the entire cluster, knows where the data is, refactors queries, and understands how to take a, a basic query operation, uh, instruct uh, the nodes that are then going to do the, uh, the processing. All of this is fully containerized. Um, and that's, that's really cool, because what it means is we can now go from taking a single GPU and using it to uh, co-locate various users. So you could have three or four users on a, 32, on, a single, uh, on a single 32 gigabyte card, if they were doing small workloads, to federating up uh, huge numbers of GPUs across multiple servers, all being used and accessed for a single workload with a single data set. Um, and by containerizing it, um, it means that we can actually, at runtime, when you're executing a query, decide where, how many, how much resources you need, right? So you can say, right, um, I'm going to attach a container that's got a specific amount of GPU resource allocated to it, load my data, <clears throat> and then start running those queries. The Postgres side of things, uh, and the way the GPU manager has been um, created, the GPU manager itself 
actually sits on its own port and IP address. So the GPUs can literally be physically located anywhere and your database can be separate to that. And you can use Postgres, standard Postgres functionality on that Postgres database. And then when you decide you've got a big job that you want to execute or whatever it is, you can say, right, click a button. I'm going to fire up a couple of containers or, or a single container. I'm going to attach GPU resources to that container and you can start using it as, uh, as a GPU database. Uh, and when you're finished, you click the button, all those containers are shut down and you're back to uh, a standard Postgres database. And all of that can happen at runtime. So, um, you know, this is really interesting for large enterprises where they are going to be purchasing uh, a big pool of GPU resources. And they might be wanting to chop that up, you know, on a daily basis, depending on the kind of projects that they want to be running or the workloads that they want to be running. They might even be wanting to chop them up overnight as they've got different uh, workloads running overnight. And all of this can be done uh, because everything's containerized. So you can take GPU resources from a pool, uh, allocate it to a specific job, get that job done, and return those uh, resources back to the pool. Just a clarification, uh, is your container also virtualized or is it, you know, a container has to have a physical GPU? It's, uh, I think the answer to that question is we use Docker and it's virtualized. So you could have a number of containers all uh, accessing the same GPU. What, what it does mean is when you start allocating resources on that container's GPU, it's virtual GPU, um, you need to manage that because you don't want to you know, start uh, allocating too many resources. So there is some intelligence that needs to happen that, that we manage. When I started, I started talking about, and, and on, the, uh, on the blurb as well, is how Brightlight is an AI-enabled database. Uh, so one of the things is, you know, we're, we're Postgres, uh, everything's containerized, we've got a GPU manager, all very cool stuff. But the other very, very cool thing is how we manage the GPU resources, the actual memory and the actual memory loca uh, allocation. So when we started uh, looking at our second generation GPU manager, at the time, our memory management uh, wasn't where it needed to be. And we were encountering a lot of overheads with allocating memory at runtime. And so we needed to find a way to pre-allocate memory and then just load it with data uh, before we started uh, running the queries. And um, at the same time, we were looking at how we can start integrating bright light with uh, AI type tools. And we started looking at PyTorch. It was actually Torch. And one of the reasons was Torch uh, uses Lua and uh, we use Lua as well. Um, but also Torch is um, uh, you know, a great tool, very easy to get up to speed with uh, and um, you know, a, a great option compared to, you know, the things like uh, Google TensorFlow and, and Cafe and Theano. So we looked at Torch's memory management and it had pre-allocation and it had caching and a whole lot of sophisticated things that we were looking for. And if you think about a tensor, it's a list of data, which actually conceptually is very similar to a column in a database, you know, a column in a table. And so what we've done is we've actually taken Torch memory management extended it and enhanced it and that is what we are using to manage the columns in our tables in our database so when you start running sql on our columns in our database you're actually running uh, down on the gpu instructions on torch memory allocated tensors and that means that you can then do the full remit end to end from sql and doing all your data preparation, these, this data ends up, or is, uh, Torch tensors. So you can immediately then start to run Torch operations, and Torch thinks that it's working with one of its own tensors. So when you declare a Torch tensor, you use the table name and column name in the definition, and now you've got a Torch tensor, PyTorch tensor, because we've, we've moved from Torch to PyTorch, but you've got a PyTorch tensor that is essentially reading data directly out of the database on GPU as if it was its own tensor, which is, which is really, really cool. How many, how many of you guys are um, doing stuff with PyTorch, say? 
Okay, one, two, anyone else? Three, four, five, okay. Brilliant, so this means that you can start uh, running. In a, so how much of your time is spent doing stuff on a database, extracting it, and then loading it into a PyTorch module? That's an element of work, is it? Okay. Everyone has flat files. Flat files, okay. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, okay, so, right, so we've touched on uh, Postgres, uh, the GPU manager, levels of parallelization, the fact that we're using PyTorch as our memory management. Uh, I'm just curious for sure. clarification. Does it mean that the data you stored on GPU, I mean, in your database, just have the exactly same format that you are going to feed into PyTorch data from the beginning? Absolutely. Literally. So you literally say, right, I want this column to now be a tensor. Uh, zero copy, that column, as far as PyTorch is concerned, is a tensor. Sure, sure. Which is, I mean, it's, it's amazing because you can now create a model and use SQL to inject data into your tensor. Train your model again, adjust it. You can feed data back into the database using your tensor as well. So it really, uh, you know, just totally short circuit all that effort between database work and um, uh, you know building models and, and this is you know you can use it for deep learning um, I know you said that you know a lot of you guys are using flat files but you know uh, often actually that flat file data will come out of a database on that slide earlier a uh, huge amount of time is actually spent running SQL queries preparing the data that would fit into those flat files um, how do you expose like what, what like to, like I get it, like you update the Postgres catalog and say I have these tables, right? Yep. How do you expose it to like PyTorch so that someone could come directly at, at your tensor from PyTorch that's sitting down the GPU? So we uh, make some changes in PyTorch, but when you uh, create a PyTorch tensor and you uh, use a descriptor, the function that you use to create that tensor, the parameter, one of the parameters that you insert is the table name and column name. And everything else just happens. Basically, there's some some clever stuff that happens with pointers, and uh, the the uh, the PyTorch code then basically, as far as it con is concerned, is working with a tensor. But that's that's you know that's one of the fundamental things with our IP and our domain expertise. Uh, you know, if I totally revealed it, it would be uh, we starting to touch on that kind of stuff. But basically, yeah, makes sense. Cool. Okay. Good. So your question about um, uh, getting data on and off disk. So, uh, sorry, on and off GPU. Um, IBM has a great product nowadays, uh, NVLink onto the motherboard. Uh, and that means that you can start to transfer data from CPU RAM to the GPUs uh, at 150 gig a second per GPU. Um, when we started doing this on Power8, the first time we tried it, it didn't work. Um, we were getting sort of close to PCIe type performance with data transfer and we were wondering what was going on. So the issue here is you do need to really take into consideration NUMA um, and what was happening there is uh, when we were getting those uh, slow uh, uh, performance uh, benchmarks was the, the memory, the data for this core was being transferred onto these GPUs uh, I needed to go through this bus, the CPU, uh, to, the socket to socket bus. Um, so if you do want to make full use of these, uh, of NVLink and, and really um, get maximum bandwidth for the hardware available, you actually have to construct uh, two GPU managers uh, and use NUMA to make sure that uh, those GPUs are allocated to the correct sockets. So for a Power 8 or Power 9 system, we will actually have two GPU managers running on that even though it's the same system. For us, that doesn't really matter because each GPU manager uh, presents itself as a port and IP address, so very easy for us to do that. How common do you see Power 9 deployments in there, like people that are running right like now? Um, I'd say... Percentage-wise? Like yeah, you know, uh, you know, it's got a lot to do with what's in-house already, actually, so there will be decisions that companies have made uh, on hardware already. Um, this is fairly new technology, and I suppose there's, you know, there's, a, there's a form of education, but it's very much dictated by existing uh, relationships that are already in place. Okay. But the, the performance improvements are, are you know, fantastic, because if you have to do this with PCIe, you're looking at you know, 16 to 32 gig, whatever, 
uh, the latest is today compared to uh, what we, we were getting benchmarks out recently on a Power 9 box, 250 uh, giga second data transfer. That was, that was actually benchmarked. That's not theoretical. That was uh, actually measured, which is, which is faster than the memory on the CPU, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> when you bring this together, I was talking a lot about how uh, Brightlight is very GPU centric and uh, you know a lot of our effort, our initial effort has been working on how to get the data onto the GPUs, keep it there and operate it there and really tap into that GPU power. Um, but there are workloads that have got larger data sets and we need to then really start to think about how you get uh, more of those CPU resources into play. So using NUMA, uh, using level 3 polarization which allows us to stream data onto GPU, uh, we are now creating what we call the big f***ing column. So this is uh, one of the Falcon Heavy Lift rockets and uh, I think the next iteration of this is the big f***ing rocket. Right? So um, our BFC, big federated column, is uh, all about uh, introducing the ability to have a column that sits over from GPU through CPU resources all the way down to disk and to access and make use of those resources according to the use case. So there are use cases that you do have a huge amount of data and really what one wants to be doing is using disk-based solutions for that, cheaper. Um, you might have you know, slightly smaller data sets and the ability to store that in CPU RAM, great, we can take care of that. And if you want very, very fast performance on slightly smaller data sets again, then we can do that as well with uh, um, the standard GPU uh, platform that we've got at the moment. A little bit of benchmarks. I heard that you guys are very interested in uh, actual benchmarks and hard and fast figures. Has anybody seen this uh, website? Mark Levinsic? Okay, yeah. Okay, great. So he's done a lot of benchmarking. He's got a fairly standard benchmark. He's got four queries, a billion row data set, um, and he's looked at all sorts of scenarios. At the top there, we've got bright light. Uh, this was on power 8. There's our 5 millisecond benchmark, um, 188 milliseconds for the more complex query. Uh, some of our competition are here. Um, but I'd like to introduce you or draw your attention to Spark. Okay, so Spark, uh, very common, well used, popular in memory type database. Um, this is on 11 uh, AWS instances. This was on 5 uh, IBM nodes. Um, this runtime is 10 seconds. That runtime over there is 5 milliseconds. So obviously there's a cost trade-off. That IBM Minsky hardware is a lot more expensive. But if you had to scale up this, part, this, this hardware, spend the same on hardware, you would still be getting a massive improvement in performance. And so what we're talking about here is not only absolute speed, but also the efficiency of the resources. Cost per query on Brightlight is actually cheaper than any of these solutions uh, that you see below you because GPU, GPUs are just so good at what they do. So what, what I mean, I mean is not running the same hardware. Yeah. Um, there was, a, there was a, a bit of a Twitter conversation yeah. when this came out. Uh, and we did say to MapD that this, uh, the second benchmark here is on AWS. Uh, they were totally able to, you know, it would be very easy for them to refute this and say, you know what, we're going to run it on AWS ourselves and show you that we are at least as fast. It's a day's worth of work, right? <laughs> so, I mean, the question is, like, what, what do you think the, I mean, it's about the, for map B, I mean, it's hard to compare the hardware. It's like, yeah. uh, okay, yeah. I've got a, uh, Okay, so okay, so you're talking about okay. So my question is like, like, what are? Is there something fundamental about what you're doing that's different than what they're doing, or is it just better engineering? So um, and maybe also another question is like, what percentage of this? Like, take take ClickHouse, which is in memory database. Sure. What percentage of your performance gain is is due because you're in the GPU, or is it is it because again something about the implementation? So I think if you if you if you did the sort of comparisons, um, we would still come out. Uh, faster than MapD. Um, it's probably about two times faster or something like that. If it, Why? Well, the only thing that's different is the software, right? 
So the hardware is exactly the same, the queries are exactly the same, the data is exactly the same. So the software, underlying software is, is better and faster, better engineered. Um, but 2x on, you know, on a platform that is already hundreds of times faster than everybody else doesn't really matter. Uh, I think what's really important actually is to say performance times with MapD are you know, in the same ballpark. But Brightlight is using Postgres, uh, and there's a whole lot of stuff that you get from Postgres for free, like store procedures, curses, user-defined functions, uh, native JSON, uh, connectors, the whole environment around Postgres. Every, pretty much every visualization tool that you'll see on the market today has got a Postgres connector. So you can take Tableau, install it, and use your Postgres connector on Tableau to connect to a Brightlight database and start accelerating your dashboard. What a, Excel, uh, anything will have a Postgres connector. All your Py, uh, Python code have, have got um, Postgres connectors. So it's the fact that uh, uh, we're using Postgres uh, and also the fact that we are using PyTorch memory management. So you can start to run some of these AI workloads directly on uh, data that's uh, already been um, uh, managed in the database. So this is uh, a benchmark that we did on Dell, um, TPCH query six. Um, we were seeing, this is on the GPUs, uh, on the, uh, the 940, <coughs> four, um, four GPUs. So uh, seeing throughput of 2.1 rows, 2.1 billion rows per second, 360 giga second. Um, TPCH was in 20 milliseconds, TPCH 6, 20 milliseconds. Uh, Usain Bolt, 150 milliseconds. So very, very fast database. What scale factor is this? The scale factor uh, was, I think it was, um, so there's 16, G, 16 gig GPUs, four of them and we were loading them at about 60%. So I don't know what that, that would work out to be. 128, so 100 gigs, so scale, probably scale factor 100. Yeah, yeah, something like that. This is uh, some benchmarking that uh, Scream have published. So when you think about the, the throughputs there, I'm not talking about the total size, so we're talking about a total size of data of about 100 gig for the bright light benchmark. Um, this data set, you know, massively bigger, um, but the run times are, you know, in minutes, um, if not hours. So just highlighting the fact that different vendors are taking different approaches. This is, these performance metrics are very similar to what you would see on a disk-based database. And the performance metrics that you'll see on bright light are very much different to that, or what you're gonna see on a GPU accelerated database. So these are the, the actual queries. This is MapD. Um, in these two queries, we were using indexing. So we're using pre-sorted data uh, in, these, uh, in these projections or permutations that we really talked about. Um, that gives us a, a massive performance improvement, but it's sensible, right? So indexing is a very old, well-understood way of accelerating queries. Uh, and the, you know, the original indexes were actually copies of data. So well understood, um, gave us a significant performance improvement because a lot of the work has been up, done up front. When we look at uh, a lot of our workloads, 90% to 95% of the time, there's sort involved. Uh, and you know, 90% of the, the runtime is actually doing the sort. Everything after that is actually very, very quick and easy after that. And you use sorting for group buys, right? Very easy to understand your group buys. And once you're doing that, all the follow-on calculations are very quick and easy. Wait, so you're saying, this is, this is bright light, so 9% of the execution time of a, of a query is spent on sorting. For this... Uh, for, the, for these two here? For these kinds of queries, yeah. Okay. The question, uh, do you do any code generation? No. Um, so for MAPD, does that time include code generation as well? No, that would be unfair. Because for MAPD, you the first query, the first time you run the query would be really, really slow. Okay. So that runtime will be like, I don't know, 
ten times that. Sometimes it's a, sometimes it's a second or more. Um, but it's not just indexing that allows us to be really, really fast. Uh, these are unindexed queries. Um, so this is just raw compute, raw performance, uh, and still fairly significantly faster. And so that's, this is where I, you know, this is probably, you know, if you're going to compare to MapD, this is probably more the kind of performance characteristics uh, that separate the two. Uh, MapD doesn't have indexing, so you can never have that option to choose it, right? Um, the good thing about bright light is you you do want to accelerate and you can and uh, indexing is an option then use it and you get a fantastic improvement in performance um, so sorting really really important to all of our database operations if you're going to be using indexing uh, if you're going to be doing group buys if you're going to be using uh, recursive interaction probability on your joins sorting is massive mass uh, is massively important um, so, by tonic sort, uh, n log n, parallelizable. I imagine you're all very familiar with by tonic sort, right? Has I, anybody? I teach in my class, so. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Has anybody tried to implement this on a GPU? Excellent. <laughs> How was it? It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> I, I don't mean performance wise, I mean effort wise. Did you do it in an afternoon? More than a day, okay. And it was probably very specific to the hardware that you had available and the data sets that you were looking at and all those kinds of things. It was trying to generalize it using thrust. So it was... There you go, right, okay. Brilliant lead on. So what is the, do you know what the, uh, the uh, sorting algorithm that thrust uses? I think it's Bitonic or Radix. So Radix is the other one. Oh, it does it? Okay, excellent. You can repeat what he says because the video won't pick it up. Okay. Sorry, say it again. Uh, it, uh, the Bitonic sort comes as a sample for CUDA. Right, so Bitonic sort comes as a sample with CUDA. That's right. So, exactly. So, so, okay. So, what we were doing to start off with, and this is leading up to thrust, right? So, we don't actually write very many of our own CUDA kernels because the level of effort to do that is massive. And there are some fantastic algorithms where, you know, somebody's already spent all that effort uh, looking at the best options. So, we use thrust. Uh, to do a lot of our coding, we write very, very few of our kernels or very few of our, our GPU stuff is actually uh, hand rolled uh, CUDA. Um, and the sample that you're talking about, our discovery, we were looking at uh, wanting to initially write our own kernels. And that sample that you're talking about in the CUDA, uh, I think it's one to 10, right? And there's all the different samples. And the first one is the uh, uh, getting the stats out of your hardware, right? Um, we looked at that, trying to tease it into our existing uh, application, and the level of effort was massive. The thing with Thrust is that it, it abstracts away all that complexity. Fantastic tool, gives you the best algorithms, um, and allows you to run on all sorts of different hardware with different configurations. All of that is, is taken care of. So we don't actually, the, the purpose of this slide was, uh, these two slides was really to demonstrate how important sorting is to us, uh, that there are fantastic sorting algorithms out there that are parallelizable uh, with great big O uh, notation complexity, uh, and they're all there for you in things like Thrust and other libraries, so good. Um, we've talked a little bit about indexing. Our indexes are really pointers, uh, arrays of pointers. Uh, that means that they're very light, um, whether you have a covering index or uh, just a standard index on a single column, all you need to be doing is uh, storing an array of pointers. So uh, very, very lightweight. And that means that um, we're, we're talking about this, uh, with, I was talking about it uh, with Andy earlier. So um, there are two sort of ways of approaching indexing. You can either make a copy of the, the data or you can use pointers. And in memory, obviously, you can use pointers. GPU resources are still relatively expensive. And so we're adopting what is effectively a much lighter weight um, alternative to this or implementation to this while still getting a lot of the benefits. So a bit more marketing speak. Um, Postgres, GPU managers, containerized, PyTorch, uh, we've got basically three products that we uh, are taking to market. 
There's the Bright Light database, which is a Postgres clone. Uh, it's got the patent pending IP, which allows us to do joins very efficiently. Um, and according to benchmarking, the fastest database in the world. BrightMind, which is what we're really excited about. SQL plus artificial intelligence, all running on GPU. Um, directly connect to the database using PyTorch. Uh, and then we've got Spotlight, which is uh, an analytics workbench, browser-based. So just uh, username and login. Uh, and from that, you can then access um, a full-blown SQL editor. So do all your DML, DDL, data loading, all via the browser. You've got a full workbench of uh, analytic tools, so you can do all your charts, uh, geographic, uh, geospatial mapping. Um, and you can also link that up with um, uh, Jupyter. So there's also a Jupyter client, and you can start to write PyTorch all from a browser. Everything's there, all running on GPU, end-to-end, um, -end, SQL, AI, and uh, a workbench which to drive it all. Um, GPU resources, very, very fast, very, very expensive. So where does it actually fit into the kind of use cases that you might look at? Hadoop, uh, open source, cheap and cheerful. You can store huge amounts of data on disk and access it intelligently. Something like Pivotal Green Plum, uh, maybe a bit more expensive, a um, bit more performance, and not able to deal with the kind of scale that Hadoop can deal with. Bright lights, very much focused on performance. Um, and I think if one looks at you know, uh, how data is accessed and the value of data, relevancy and age are, are really important aspects. Um, not necessarily in, you know, in this, this context, but you know, in, in a business context, what customers are doing today is, not really, is, is a lot more valuable than what your machine logs are from two years ago. So what Bright Light is all about is looking at high value data and getting that data onto GPU and then using analytics, very fast analytics to really get value out of that. I'm going to talk a little bit about Postgres now, why we're we using Postgres. Um, so what we get out of Postgres is basically the first two parts uh, of this side, the parser and the optimizer. So you know, we've talked about algorithms, we've talked about GPUs, but actually all of that is meaning, meaningless until, you, uh, until a user can actually connect to it and use it. And that means writing SQL code. And as soon as somebody starts writing SQL code, you need to pass it and generate the execution uh, execution plans and so on. So we use Postgres to do that. Uh, you can obviously build your own, and so Flex and Biosyn, that book, will tell you how to write your own SQL parser. Um, but what you get then from Postgres is an execution plan, and it's this that we then traverse and feed across to the GPU manager uh, to execute um, each one of these components. So the GPU manager doesn't necessarily have to worry about trying to pass uh, SQL statements. It doesn't need to worry about creating an execution plan. All of that is done up front. Um, and that means that all that effort that we uh, might have had to incur is actually done in Postgres. Uh, all we need to worry about is each of these individual elements. As long as the GPU manager can process each one of these individual elements, um, then we've got a, a working database, very, very fast database. A um, bit more about Postgres and how, how the uh, interaction looks. Um, so we've got our GPUs, the GPU manager manages those. And what we've done is rewritten large parts of the Postgres database engine so that instead of uh, processing code and data on CPU, it just hands that off to the GPU and gives it an instruction. Right, I need to do a join. There are the tables, there are relations. This is what needs to happen. They'll need to do a calculation or expression. Uh, and uh, that's handed off to the GPU manager and actually run on GPU. Any questions? Are there any Postgres queries that uh, aren't supported? There are. So not everything has been ported over to GPU. Um, so there are, you know, say, for instance, windowing functions. We don't yet support that. Um, but, but I meant those will just still run on the CPU as opposed to generating an error. Um, so if you try and run a SQL operation that hasn't on GPU data that hasn't been implemented on GPU, you will get uh, some form of a message. Okay. Sometimes what, what, what we might do is, um, for instance, if you try and join a Postgres table with a GPU table, 
it will use Postgres and it'll access that. It'll just use the GPUs for uh, data access. Uh, but if you try and do uh, something a bit more complicated, that has, so there are stats functions that we haven't yet implemented. There are Postgres functions that we haven't yet implemented. Um, but you know, 90, 99% of the kind of workloads that people are going to be running, typically, you can run uh, using standard Postgres on GPU. Uh, okay, so this is all about um, the tools and accessing the uh, the platform. Uh, in the middle, you've got uh, the Brightlight uh, API, Brightlight software um, running on GPU. Uh, on the top, you have all the tools that you can access the platform with. Um, so obviously Postgres, you can use PSQL, pgAdmin, anything that would connect to a Postgres database, you can use. Um, we've got uh, connectors. Because it's Postgres, all of these visualization tools will work. Tableau will work, Power BI. We've got our own visualization tool uh, called Spotlight, which I mentioned earlier, uh, a workbench. Uh, and then also Torch and Jupyter, those will also work. Uh, on the bottom, using foreign data wrappers, which is standard Postgres functionality, you can access data from any one of these uh, data sources. I think, I think there's something like 60 foreign data wrappers um, around that, yeah. So uh, pretty much everything from flat files to Twitter to Oracle, Hadoop, uh, OpenStack, MySQL, MariaDB, uh, you can get that data directly from that data source into the platform and start using it. But like, like if you use a foreign data wrapper, are you going to take it out and shove it down to the GPU and process on it? Or is it going to sit in Postgres? So you can decide what you want to do. Um, but what you would typically do is it's a way of intelligently getting data out of uh, out of um, a third party source. So you run an SQL query and load it onto GPU. Okay, that's what I'm getting. So it's not as much more than just I, I have a foreign data wrapper that Postgres can already support. It's I shove it down to bright light into GPU. So what, what it means is you can run an SQL statement that says insert into GPU table, select statements. Okay. Um, so you can get data from 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 any of these data sources instead of having to run a SQL statement on the database into flat file and then flat file into the GPU. You just go straight from, from an existing data source onto GPU with a single SQL statement. Um, just a little bit about joins, ultra fast joins, a rational database. Uh, you know, the whole uh, thing there is in the name relations and being able to join data is really, really important. And a lot of the vendors are only now coming to grips with being able to join data on GPU. Um, it's something that we've had for a very long time with recursive interaction probability. Um, this slide is probably, you know, really familiar for you, so I'm not going to uh, dive into that too much. Um, and this is the wrap-up. So we've got Brightlight uh, GPU Accelerated Postgres, Spotlight, which is the workbench, uh, and allows you to do end-to-end, -end SQL, AI, dashboards, um, uh, visualizations, Jupyter, all in one space and BrightMind, which is this ability to use PyTorch, because we're fundamentally using PyTorch memory allocation for storing data uh, and running SQL workloads, and also uh, doing AI-type workloads using PyTorch. And that is the end. All right, let's thank Richard. Uh, we have time for one question. Go for it. Since you're using PyTorch, do you think it'd be feasible to run Brightlight on uh, Google's Tensor browser? So, so, would it be possible to also use Google TensorFlow uh, in the same way? Is that what well, they're the... TPU, like Google's dedicated hardware? Good question. Um, we would need to be using NVIDIA GPUs because of thrust and all of that. that uh, um, all that comes with thrust. And I think a lot of what PyTorch actually does is, it, it, I'm guessing, yeah, but I think it'll probably use thrust and uh, those kinds of things. I don't think it uses open uh, GL, open CL. So the answer to that is no. Good. All right, guys. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much. All right. Uh, the next talk is November 29th, and there'll be the last talk of the seminary series, and that'll be uh, the Swarm 64 guys. Okay? All right, have a good weekend, everyone. Let's take a trip to the far side and black suits troops the group on the storm. And the uncivilized island of New York where the criminals run the project, developing two drug spots. I be sleeping through the screens and rapid fire shots. My
my block consists of multiple juvenile offenders and their crews. I'm telling you, even free sense get dead zone. These kids making fix peep this. Operation safe home and shit. Giuliani got these perpetrating housing cops on the dicks. Now ain't this a bitch?